Have your Bibles open to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter number 5 tonight. As we continue in our series, we picked up again last week doing some review. We'll continue some review tonight. We're in the series on alcohol and the Christian. Alcohol and the Christian. What part, what role does the Bible have in our decisions? And then what role now in the topic of a Christian and alcoholic beverage? And uh, Lord willing, we'll get to some of that tonight. We were reviewing last week, and I have some more review to do, to do tonight. I know that as I review, that some of you will remember everything I have ever said. I know that. And if you would have forgotten, then you would have gone back and watched to make sure that you remembered everything I ever said. No, you just remember the mistakes I make in life. Remember those perfect. That, that's okay. I don't mind that. That's why I review. Uh, I was talking to Pastor Olette before we, or during the transition time, and he said, he said, Brother Howell, he said, if the church doesn't think you're saying the same thing, then you're not saying it enough. All right? And that was Pastor Olette's advice. That's pretty good advice. You're like, uh oh, what are you going to say? Well, love God, serve God, have a relationship with God. But tonight we're going to look at the things, and I'm going to read a verse as we begin, and then we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 5. The verse we started with last week that's kind of been the foundation for the series has been 2 Timothy 2.15, where Paul says to Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Just to remember, remind us where we're at. Remember that we're to study God's word. We're to know God's word. We're, we're not just to have a, a copy of it in our household or on our phones, but we're supposed to study it and love it and know it. God gave us His words, the inspired Word of God, which you get to hold in your hand. You realize that is a privilege that many people never had. And you have copy upon copy upon copy. And I fear that when we go to heaven, one question that we'll have to answer at the judgment seat of Christians of 2020 is why we treated this book so lightly when we had so much access, so many tools, you know, pastor, it's, it's difficult to understand. They use words like thee and thou. And we don't always use those words today. That's true. But my daughter, Danielle, who's now seven. She's seven, honey? Seven. Okay, don't tell her I asked. Right, she's definitely seven. No doubt in my mind, she's seven. She reads her Bible in the morning, and she reads from the King James Version. She comes across a word sometimes that she doesn't understand. She'll ask, Daddy, what does this word mean? And i uh, try to help her out. But you know what? There's a whole bunch that she gets as she writes, and I love looking at her little, her, little, her little devotional journal and what she learns from God's Word. Man, it's powerful. It's good stuff. You can know God's Word. We're supposed to study it, though. Approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Oh, people can twist Scripture all over the place. The verse that most everyone who's not a Christian knows is not really a verse, but they quote it this way. The Bible says you're not supposed to judge. They say, the Bible says it, doesn't it? Well, yes and no. All right? But they want to twist it to mean something. They say, well, listen, God says to love everybody. Does the Bible say that to love everybody? Sure. Does that negate anything, any reactions I should have or what is right and wrong? No. So people can twist it. We're supposed to rightly divide the word of truth. Let's ask the Lord's help as we look at some of these things like tonight and continue in our series on alcohol and the Christian. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for this time. Lord, I pray you'd give us your wisdom. Lord, help me as I speak to be able to, to clearly speak those truths from your word. Lord, I pray you'd help us to understand them. Lord, to help, help us, though, to live them and not just to have a knowledge or, or to think that sounds nice or good or decent, Lord, but to apply them to our hearts. Would your spirit touch us tonight? Lord, I pray that there'd be no hindrances in the service. Lord, there's so many elements that could distract us and distract us from the truth of your word. But I pray that you would hinder all of those things so your word would be unhindered. Lord, we ask for your help and blessing. Lord, I need you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Open there to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll get there in just a moment. Last week we looked at the first word, which was what we have labeled as a principle. A principle, as, we've, as we have defined it, is a Bible truth that I must live by. Help me with now. A principle is what? A principle is a Bible truth that I must live by. A Bible truth is always true. You will either live it and reap the blessing of it, or you will ignore it and reap the consequence of it. But a Bible truth is always always true. God created the heaven and the earth. That is a Bible truth. 
All right, whether you believe it or not, whether anyone believes it or not, whether they think they can disprove that does not change the fact that that is true. That's a Bible truth. There are many such truths in God's Word. There are some that are commands. Those are the easy ones to find. All right, should I murder my annoying neighbor? I don't have one, just to take an example. Well, obviously not. The Bible commands me not to kill. It would probably include any neighbor, of, or any neighbor problems I'm having. Right? Those are the easy ones. All right, should I use filthy language? No, that's an easy one. All right, to figure out. Should I be a good testimony for the Lord? That's an easy one to figure out. A Bible truth. It's something I must live by. There are commands. There are teachings. Jesus taught a lot of Bible tr principles that are Bible truths. He taught in John chapter 15 about how we're supposed to abide in Him. All right, that is a truth I must live by. If I don't abide in Him as a Christian, I will be washed up, wasted, and empty. You want to know why sometimes you as a Christian are washed up, wasted, and empty? Because you're not abiding in Jesus Christ. It's a Bible truth that we must live by. Like, Pastor, I'm just wore out. I'm at wit's end. I am just stressed out. I am overwhelmed. I am just had it with life. Washed up, wasted, and empty. Right? Abide in Jesus. And he says, without me, you can do nothing. There's commands, there's teachings, and then there's examples in Scripture. A lot of examples that, are, that show us the truth from God's Word, what it's like to be ruled by the flesh or ruled by a relationship with God. Daniel was one such man who was ruled by his relationship with God. So he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat or the wine which he drank. Because he was ruled by the relationship, he reaped the blessing, a Bible truth. There are principles in God's Word. And from those, we then gain convictions. So Bible truth we know, it's a principle, and we gain it by studying, by reading, by memorizing. Maybe you're going to mark in your Bible, maybe another sheet of paper, maybe you're going to study somewhere else. But then you come to convictions. Now, a conviction is a personal belief from the Holy Spirit based on a principle. Now, don't worry, at the end of this for tonight, I will give you some examples of all three of these things together, okay? So don't get too lost on me, but a conviction is a personal belief from the Holy Spirit based on a principle. This says this, Paul says in Galatians, This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Romans, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Paul in Corinthians says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You see, as we study and learn Bible principles, the Holy Spirit will convict us about certain actions and attitudes and things we're doing that displease the Lord based on a Bible principle. And from that I draw a conviction. Remember this concept that some of these can be personal. I used a few last week. I used one of beards. For some Christians for many years, beards were not just a, a preference, they were sinful. It was sinful to have a beard. And if you had a beard, you were not pleasing God. Well, I don't find that in Scripture. Like I mentioned last week, I take you just to Jesus. All right, they plucked out his beard, it even says in the Bible, right? Now, that's not a problem. If someone says, well, because of a certain movement and the way beards are associated with, we want to be different and be distinct of salt and light and have a distinction, then we're not going to have beards. I'm fine with that. That distinction is a Bible principle. All right? But a conviction is not the same as a principle. What is sin for some may not be sin for others. Other people said, listen, you can't, as a good Christian, wear wire rim glasses. They preached it. They preached it. Brother Kemp, you're shaking your head. I mean, may remember these sermons. You cannot wear wire rim glasses. Wire rim glasses are, are, are everything, are everything that is held in fleshliness and carnality and wickedness. Many of you tonight are in such, some such state, all right? I expect to see you at the altar tonight, all right, getting right. Well, listen, and I, I do not jest at them for that because if that's what the Lord has brought them to, and being a distinction and being different, I'm not going to mock them for that, all right? That's okay. But you can't preach that from God's Word. You can't say, listen, the Bible says, thou shalt not wear wire-rimmed glasses. 
You're not going to find it in there. At the same time, can we draw conviction and say, listen, that's not going to be a good testimony for us? Absolutely. That's a conviction. There are some things in my family, as a father of the home and leader of the home, husband, that said, kids and, and honey, we're not going to do this right here. The Bible doesn't say don't do it, but we're not going to do this because of the Bible principle over here. And I'll get to some of these, all right? That's okay for a family to have some personal convictions. To say, listen, as for me and my house, this is what we're going to do. Now, me not listening to Christian music before uh, till after Thanksgiving, that's not a conviction. Right? That's, a, that's a preference. It was changed last year with my daughter, and my wife's still bitter about that. And the Bible talks about bitterness. I hope she reads that part. Another one was screens in church. Screens in church, we have a couple of them, five to be exact, in the auditorium. All right, one, two, three, four, five, right here. Boy, 12, uh, more like 20 years ago, this right here, those screens, absolutely just pagan. Everyone knows that God inspired the hymnal. Now, I'm not against hymnals. There's one in the back of all the pews. You see, look in front, you see a little red book hymnal. I'm not opposed to them. All right, but let's be honest, when uh, the printing press came out, they were against that too. Okay? Now, if a church says we shouldn't have a screen, in our church that's not good for us, that's a-okay. But that's a conviction, not a Bible principle. Read your Bible from cover to cover, you will not see the word screen in that context mentioned. But a conviction, the Holy Spirit will bring to you. Remember that these convictions must be covered in grace. The Lord may not have dealt with someone else like, they did, like He has dealt with you. I mentioned a personal one, how when I was a youth pastor and preached at Community Baptist of Saginaw, I was in the mall that night, right? And the uh, Lord touched me about not dressing like, just, just like a bum, all right, and dress up a little bit. That's just for me. I would not preach, well, you better not wear jeans out in public, all right? But for me, the Lord said, you, you know, in what I've called you to do, I want you to look a little bit nicer. That's a conviction. Remember, though, that the problem, a problem arises when we think everything is just a personal conviction. Well, the Lord hasn't touched me about that, so it must not be wrong. No, read your Bible. There are, most things in life are covered by Bible principles. Most things are pretty clear with a little bit of study in God's Word. But Christians, oh, I just don't feel convicted. I don't feel bad about that. Then then I'm supposed to say as a pastor, oh, well, if you don't feel bad, my mistake. I didn't know you didn't feel bad about that. Well, I won't talk about that anymore. And I shared this example that a few years back I read that account in a Christian magazine about a Christian gospel singer who felt the Holy Spirit had led her to divorce her husband, not for any legitimate reasons, just because he led her that way. That's not in the Bible, folks. And that wasn't the Holy Spirit. I don't know who it was, but it was not the Holy Spirit. That wasn't him. But we can't fall into the trap that everything is just a personal conviction. Well, you know, Pastor, you feel a personal conviction about modesty, but I don't. I'm sorry, modesty is found in the Bible. Ladies and men, both. All right, modesty is found in the Bible. It's a Bible principle. Well, I just, I just read it differently. No, you just don't read it. <laughs> you want me to keep on going? <laughs> I better get home, but I get stuck here. No, no. Well, God hasn't touched me about, about giving to Him. God hasn't touched me about my music. Well, your music's pagan. It's ungodly. All right, he's already talked about what to fill your mind with. You're like, but pastor, I like country music. There's a lot of things that my flesh likes that are not right. And your flesh is the same. And if I go based on what I feel and what I like, I will end up in a world of hurt, and that's a Bible principle. Because if I sow to the flesh, the principle, I shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if I sow to the Spirit, I'll reap life ever everlasting. That's a Bible principle. So I must sow to the Spirit, not to my flesh, not what I feel. In case I wonder how my, what my heart is like, read Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. You want to know what that feeling is telling you? Typically, it's telling you the wrong way to go. My feeling tells me I should be mean to my enemies. My Bible tells me to love my enemies. My Bible tells me to repay evil for evil. Or my body tells me to repay evil for evil. My Bible tells me to do good to them which despitefully use me and persecute me. I can't go off my feeling. And not everything is just a personal conviction. So there's a principle. 
That's a Bible truth I must live by. There's a conviction. Read this with me now. Conviction is a personal belief from the Holy Spirit based upon a principle. You can't arbitrarily grab these things. John tells us that the Holy Spirit speaks of me, Jesus says. Jesus is the Word. There's one more I go to, and we call that a standard. A standard is a guideline that helps me keep my convictions. Read that with me now. A standard is a guideline that helps me keep my convictions. We find this talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, where Paul makes this statement, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. They're not all beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Not everything that I can do, I should do. And not everything I can do helps build the body of believers. All things edify not. He goes in that passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 23-33 to talk about how he seeks not his own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. Paul identifies it in his life and I'd like us to identify this as well, there is something bigger than you and me. Or the world does not revolve around you. You're not the epicenter of the universe and neither am I. Sometimes we live our life that way. Well, if they have a problem with it, they can just deal with it. I don't live for them. Well, Paul says, I live for others so I don't hinder the gospel. We come to a standard and a standard is a guideline that helps me keep my convictions. Convictions, of course, being based upon Bible principles. A standard, I'd also say it this way, is a guardrail. If you go down I-75, as you cross a bridge, there will be these metal things on the side of the bridge, right? Or before a bridge. They're called guardrails. Now, what are guardrails for? Yeah, the, for stopping cars. That is one benefit of guardrails. But they're not, you're like, oh, I need to stop right here, guardrail. You know what, I always want a new paint job on the passenger side of my car. I think I'll hit this guardrail. It's not what a guardrail is for. A guardrail is there so that if you run off the road, you know you're supposed to stay between the lines? The lines are your friend. Pastor Scott, you're taking notes. The lines are your friend. It's a story for another day. The lines are your friend. If you miss the lines, most places on I-75, there's what they call rumble strips. Or, for some of you, alarm clocks. <laughs> they wake you up when you're sleeping. Brother Rob, I'm sure your time on, on the road, it would happen sometimes. They think rumble strips. If you don't wake up at the rumble strips, if you miss the lines, then you can, in certain places, hit a guardrail. If you hit a guardrail, you typically mess up your car. They're not car friendly. They're not wrapped in rubber or wrapped in foam. They don't just like push you back on. No, they smash up the side of your car. They smash up more than the side of it. But the idea is that if you hit a guardrail and you smash up your car, you don't end up in a ditch farther down dead. Is a guardrail where you're supposed to drive? No. If you drive guardrail to guardrail, please don't ever offer to take my children anywhere. Please don't drive by me. Don't park in the front lot. Park across the street. Park somewhere else. But if you see someone driving guardrail to guardrail, you wouldn't say, wow, what a safe driver. Man, I, you know what? Let me get right behind them and follow them. Would you? You'd say, whoa, is that guy drunk? Remember that. We're getting to alcohol in the Christian in just a minute, all right? I'm going somewhere. But you, you, you say, whoa, it's, but it's so I don't run off the road. A standard is here. So that if I happen to break a standard that I have, all right, it keeps me, hopefully, from violating a principle from God's Word. If I violate a principle from God's Word, this is not a good thing. God doesn't take lightly when I violate His principles. I don't want to live my life violating God's principles, and I don't want you to either. So a standard helps me keep the convictions. Helps me, hopefully, keep the, the, the principles that God has. Can a standard ever change? Let me give you one example, and then I'll kind of work through this. 
there is a principle in God's word that says it is a shame for a man to have long hair. Bible says that, right? It is a shame for a man to have long hair. Right? Can we agree on that? Just say yes, the Bible says it. All right? So it's, it's not up for debate. All right? So my conviction then is, you know what? I don't, I don't want to be shameful in God's economy. God, I, I don't want to displease you. Lord, help me, all right, to keep short hair for you. Now I have to have a standard. How long is long hair on a man? Now some of you schoolboys are like, definitely touches the ears. Woo! Touches the ears. You're out of here. Could hair touch the ears and still be short? Help me. Could, as a man, I have hair down my back and to the floor, flowing like a mane behind me as I walk and I toss my hair? Could you not agree? Could we not agree that that would be long hair on everyone's radar? If there's someone opposed, then you know what? Wake up. All right, yes. So if it's on the floor and I shake my head as I come to the pulpit and flip it over like a girl, right? It would be long hair. I'll leave you with that mental picture for a few minutes. <laughs> so somewhere between the floor and my head being shaved. That'd be short, right? Yes, it is. Somewhere between there and there is short hair and long hair. You see that? Where does that exact point take place? Give him a ruler. Boy, it gets to 1.78 inches. Boom, long hair, you're done. Bible doesn't say that, does it? I wish it did. It'd be easy, right? It is a shame for a man to have hair longer than 1.78 inches. It'd be easy for us, right? It'd be, it'd be, it'd be easy. Right, hey, here's my, you know, is, it, is this millimeters or is this inches? What are we talking about, Lord? No, well, somewhere between a shaved head and the floor is long hair and short hair. Well, I know that the Bible says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. I know that. That's clear. I know that as a conviction from the Holy Spirit, I don't want to be ashamed before the Lord. So I draw a standard that says, listen, men at school, we're going to keep kind of your hair off your eyebrows, off your collar, and above the ears. It's a standard. It is arbitrary. All right, God did not design that. In case you're wondering. God did not say, eyebrows, ears, collar. Now, some of you are shocked. What? That's not my Bible? What? Are you kidding me? No. But it's a standard to help us. If someone's hair touches their collar, for a man, could it still be considered short? It could be. Absolutely. Absolutely. If it's down to the floor... We all kind of agree it's probably long. Could the standard ever change? Could we say, well, you know what? I think if it just touches the ear, we're going to still be okay, still be short. But bless God, we've never had the hair touch the ear. Everyone knows the hair touches your ear. You're wicked and sinful. That's a standard, a guardrail. To help us keep the conviction, I don't want to be ashamed before the Lord, to keep the principle that it is a shame for a man to have long hair. That's how we kind of put them together. Let me give you a couple more examples here, kind of help us understand this, so that we live our life and make decisions based upon God's Word. Here's a Bible principle. Let me read the verse for you. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? This particular verse deals primarily in a marriage relationship, though it extends beyond that. All right, there's some other applications from this being unequally yoked, but primarily in a marriage relationship that I should not be unequally yoked with an unsafe person. And they say, well, pastor, I got saved. My spouse is not saved. What do I do? The Bible deals with that too. Bible principles, study them, and we can talk about that. But what we're saying is that for a Christian, our Christian young people, we're going to instruct them from God's Word as you look for a potential spouse, 
All right, not this year, not next year, not for 40 years, you ladies, right? And you men, it won't take you 40 years too. I see the way you look, right? The Bible principle is that we should not be unequally yoked, all right, married to someone who's unsaved. Is that clear from Corinthians, right? That's the Bible principle. So the conviction may be, well, I, would, I believe that God would have me marry also a spiritually like-minded person. The spiritual principle is to not be unequally yoked like with someone who's not saved. But as a conviction, I may then, with the Holy Spirit, say, well, I want someone who is like-minded, who believes the same about church, who believes the same about worship, who believes the same about the Bible, all right, who believes the same about faith and soul winning. There's a lot of people who are saved who are, but have a different set of beliefs maybe than, than we've been taught here at First Baptist Church, right? So my conviction is I'm going to only marry someone who's like-minded. So my standard could be, all right, this is just an example, okay, don't, 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 don't hear me, but my, my standard could be I won't date anyone that I don't see to be spiritually like-minded and spiritually passionate. All right? See how that standard comes from the conviction, I want someone like-minded, from the principle, be not unequally yoked. So that if I happen to go on a date with someone who's not as passionate of a person, oh, I violated my standard. Well, the Bible never says I can't go to coffee with someone who's not spiritually like-minded. Right? The Bible never says I haven't violated the principle. But if I violate my standard, hopefully it keeps me from violating this, which keeps me from violating this. Hopefully if I never even date someone who's not spiritually passionate and a heart for God, then hopefully, Lord willing, I won't even be tempted to marry someone who's not even saved. Because unfortunately, Christian, you've met people and probably know people who had no plans to marry someone who was not saved who believed, just like we do, that the Bible teaches to not be unequally yoked, but in the process began to be friends with someone who wasn't like-minded, who wasn't spiritually minded, who really didn't have a heart for God. And though they had no plans to violate that principle, because their heart became entangled with that, and because, like we are made to, we fall in love and we fall in this relationship in a sense, or right? we be, become bonded with somebody, that's the way God made us to do that. But because we weren't careful here, we, they ended up violating right here. Now, can you go to coffee with someone who's not that way? Yeah, and not violate, not violate the principle? Sure. But a standard helps you keep over here. Now, the principle for you, example for you. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 8 and 9, that I am to dwell on things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, things of good report, virtue and praise, and I am to think on these things, right? That is a biblical principle. My mind is to be focused. My mind is to be filled with things that are godly, that are good and true and right. Right? That's Bible principle. If I heed it, I reap the blessing. If I ignore it, anxiety, panic, now, I'm not saying that's the only thing, way those things come from, but you fill your mind with other things, you'll have issues with your mind. It's the Bible. That's the principle. The conviction, because of that Bible principle, the conviction would be I will be careful with what I allow to influence me because my thoughts are affected by those influences. So the principle is I only want to think on these things. I must keep my mind here. The conviction is I will be careful with what I allow to influence me. My standard. Let me give you some standards that I have. In our house, we mute commercials. You don't have to mute commercials. The Bible never says thou shalt mute commercials. Cover to cover, you won't find it. We mute commercials because we don't want to be influenced to have our minds not think of things that are this. You know that most, and I'm just tell you why we do commercials, most commercials are designed, or not all commercials, are designed to make you want something that you don't have yet. To make you discontent. The car that you thought was really neat doesn't park itself. It won't come when you hit the button. It won't drive itself, but this new one does. Teenagers, the shoes that you thought were great for basketball, those are the last year's shoes. This year's shoes, you can dunk with them, even if you're only four foot one. 
Ladies and men, listen, you weren't thirsty until you see the bottle of Sprite. And then it says, obey your thirst. Right? So we need commercials, hopefully, so that we can help keep our limited influence, so that our mind, Lord willing, will be focused on things that are right and true and have a good report and virtue and praise. See how this later now. If one day, though, I forget to mute a commercial, hit the guardrail, have I violated the principle? No. I don't think so, not yet. But I've maybe hit the guardrail. Boom! Oh, i got to get my mind back where it needs to be. Another one in this standard with this, I will eye limit my news intake. I'll stop here for a moment. So should you. I will preach this standard for just a moment. So should you. You understand the news is a business. They are there to make money. They are not there to inform you. They are there to make money. They sell advertisements. That's the purpose of news. If they don't make money, they fold up, collapse, and an another company comes onto the scene. This has happened with newspapers, with radio and television stations. They don't make money. They fold up. They are there to make money. So in order to make money, they must sensationalize things. I know I'm bringing in your parade. Storm of the century. You've lived through like 15 of them, right? <laughs> Stay tuned when we tell you about the weather that's coming tomorrow. This is uncommon, unheard of weather in Michigan. Everything is a tragedy. Everything is the most dangerous. Now, is it helpful to know in one sense what's going on in the world? Probably, yes. I, I like the news. I like to know what's happening around the world and in the U.S. But I limit it because what can happen for me, not talking about you, for me, but I think some of you can identify with this as well. When everything you hear is sensationalized, your mind naturally jumps and runs 100 miles an hour. So if you're listening to the sensationalized news over and over, you rev to 100, rev to 100, rev to 100, rev to 100. Guess where your mind operates? at a hundred. Very hard then to focus on what is true. What is a good report? What is praiseworthy? What has virtue in it? So I limit my news intake. If one day I happen to intake in jest, if I can, too much news, well, maybe I hit my standard, my guardrail. Say, whoa, you know what, I gotta back off on that. Because I don't want to violate this over here. I'll be careful about flipping through social media. Social media, what a, what a time waster. What a time. I'd be careful. I had to think about that and make sure. What a time waster. You say, no, no, pastor helps me know everyone's business. I rest my case. How about we know his business? Right? Because I want my mind to be filled with this, but some of you know everybody's business right now. You know who went where, who ate what, what kids are doing what, what they wore yesterday. You know, posting it right there, this and that. Some of you just lurkers. All right? You used to call them creepers, but now you're a lurker online, all right? Ooh, you know what they're doing? Look at that. Honey, look at this. Whoa. You won't believe that? I knew it. I knew it. If you're not careful, you'll violate this. Am I saying you shouldn't have social media? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But can you not see how if we're not careful, we can violate this right here very quickly? If we don't draw some good standards that help us with that, we'll violate that. It's never helpful to violate a principle from God's Word. I have one more standard in this particular principle. It's why... I would say that we shouldn't go to movie theaters. Say, oh, no, there you've done it, Pastor. I don't feel bad about that. That's just the way it is. Well, we already talked about what your heart is like. Let me tell you one reason why I don't go to movie theaters. There is rarely, if ever, anything that we watch on television that we don't mute or fast forward something. And we're talking about cartoons with the kids or stop and say to the kids you know what that's not a right philosophy 
I remember growing up, my parents would do this, and I thought, oh, dad, oh, mom. You know, right? Now I find myself doing it. If, if the, 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 the princess and prince go to kiss, the kids can't watch a kissing picture, all right? Like, oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> Good, keep thinking that, all right? Keep thinking that. One day I'll change your mind. Because the only way for things to come into me are through my eye gate, through my ear gate. And at home, I have this thing called a remote. I'm a man, I get it right by me. I can pause, I can fast forward, I can turn it off. Why would I then put the control where I can't pause? Where I can't mute something? Even cartoons are muted, that don't want to come into my household. I can mute it, right? When the song's done, I unmute it. Why would I put that in the hands of an unsafe pagan? Here, you can have the control of my eye gate and ear gate. doesn't help me right here. That's why I have drawn that standard. Another one, principle. God founded the church. Do we agree with that? Yes, but you can. I'll read the verse. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So we can clearly see from Scripture that God founded the church. The church was God's idea. Yes? You shake it around. Yes? You see that. Conviction from that. I'm convinced that not only is the church founded by God, it's really important to God. Conviction, it ought to be really important to me. Right? See how I draw that conviction? From the principle, God founded the church. Because God did this, it ought to be really important to me. So, as a pastor, standard, I try to make it as important as God would have it to be. Right? I try to be here every time the doors are open. I don't make light of church. Right? Because the church is important to God, but God founded the church. Another principle found in Hebrews did not forsake the assembling of themselves together. So my standards, Lord willing, help me keep my convictions, which are based upon principles. What can happen if we're not careful, Christian, is that all we do is hear this right here. And this is all we tell our kids, all we tell our friends, this is all we live by. Cut your hair short, go to church. All right, don't go to the movies. Mute the commercials. And if I do these things, I'm a good Christian. The Bible never says that. And begin to judge other people by that. Oh, oh no, their hair touches their ears. They don't mute commercials. They're obviously not a good Christian. These are just standards. What's important is this right here, Bible principles. And we should know why we do what we do. Dads of your home and husbands, you need to know why you do and why you lead your home a certain way from God's Word. You say, Pastor, I don't know. Then get in God's Word. All right, begin to study. Listen, family, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, so we're going to do this way. This is why as a family we will serve together. This is why we're going to go soul winning together as a family. This is why we're going to be in church when the doors are open as a family. And dads, husbands, men of the church, you, above all, men, need to know why you do what you do. But ladies, old, young, you're not off the hook. You're a Christian. You're, you're a child of God. You're to study to show thyself approved unto God. You should know why you do what you do. You should know why you don't gossip in the bathroom. You should know that. You should know why you dress modestly for the Lord. You should know that not just because, well, if my skirt doesn't hit my knee, then I'm obviously not a good Christian. Right? The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say dress modestly. You need to know why you do what you do. And as we come to this alcohol, and I did not even get there tonight, but I'll get there next week because I'm all set up now. That it's a big deal to God. Alcohol in the Christian is a big deal to God. He said in Scripture multiple times that would be a big deal to God. But we need to do and live the way the Bible teaches us. If you don't get anything else tonight, remember this. Live 
like the Bible teaches. All right? Know the Bible. Know his word. When your kids come and ask you, hey, mom, why, why do we go to church Sunday night as well? One Sunday morning, isn't that enough? Well, honey, here's what I'm going to tell you. Church is important to God. He founded it. So we're going to be there Sunday night. Oh, okay. Dad, why, why do you always put something in the offering plate? Well, son, the Bible says this is what I owe God. This is what is God's part. I want to help support. And this is why I give above that. And this is why I smile while I put it in. This is why I'm excited. Isn't God good? Hey, Grandma, your Bible's got a lot of marks in it. Why are there so many lines and words in it? Well, grandson, I'm trying to study it to show myself approved unto God. This is why I do what I do. You live that way, these other things all work out. These other things, not an issue. You'll be in the right place. Someone once said, someone once said that if everyone in your church looks the same Sunday morning, you're not doing your job. I agree with that. I'm glad you come Sunday morning, everybody looks different. All right, that's good. I have added to that phrase. And if they look the same a year from now, you're not doing your job. Someone can come to church for a year and not be touched by the truth from God's word, then we're not doing our job as well. We ought to be growing in grace, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to grow in your grace. Lord, help us to live the way you tell us and show us in your word. Lord, may we be workmen that need to not be ashamed because we've rightly divided the word of truth. Lord, help us to have principles from your word and convictions from your spirit and standards that would please you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen.